Good morning, Mount Vivers. We're so excited. Today we are starting a series that we have looked forward to for a very long time. The series is entitled Ready for Anything. Ready for Anything. But before we dive in, and I'm going to tell you right now, just a little precursor. If you don't take notes, today is a really good day to start, all right? One of the reasons why is because when you take notes, it helps you to not only think about it, but to write it and to comprehend it. And we're going to give you an awful lot in this series. So if you didn't come prepared to take notes today, I would say you better get yourself a notebook and bring it with you next week. But before we dive in, I want you guys to grab these things you have in your pockets or in your purse, pull them out. We want you guys to check in this morning, and I'm going to do it literally right now with you because sometimes the leaders in this church are the ones who don't do this. And listen to me. If I don't see you pulling out your phone, I know who the culprits are for not doing this. This is so important, guys. Checking in not only helps us to stay connected as a church, but here in these crazy times, we need to know where our people are. If you're watching online, we love our online family. You check in as well. As pastors, every week we look at this list of people. And then the people who have not checked in, we go after them. Why? Because there's an enemy who's also going after them. There's an enemy who's going after those who are trying to be in the house of God and those who are not. And listen to me, when you check in, we are able to pray over you. We're able to pray over your families. I don't know about you, but I want you praying over me. If you're not, you better add your pastors to the top of your prayer list because we need your prayers. We want to pray over you. you got to check in so we remember to call out your name. That's right. Also, how many of you guys know someone who needs hope in their life? Raise your hand. You know somebody who needs hope. You can, you can share hope by sharing today's experience on Facebook. Take that moment right now. Seriously, you have an opportunity to spread the love and the light of Jesus Christ to people that you, that you may not even see on a day-to-day -day basis, people that you know that are living in another country, somewhere far on the other side of the planet. You can reach them with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. You can do it right now thanks to technology. Okay. Listen, today's message is going to be absolutely power-packed. It's going to blow your mind with what God is wanting to do. How many of you guys would agree, uh, no matter where you're at in your understanding of the Bible or your relationship with God, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, how many of you guys would agree that this year, 2020, has just been insane? How many, how many of you guys would agree... Out of everything that you've seen from, from the beginning of the year of COVID-19, you remember how the, our, our, our shelves in the grocery stores emptied, everybody was scurrying for toilet paper, things got crazy in a hurry. We saw this economic, almost a complete economic collapse because of COVID-19. We start seeing wildfires like crazy. All of these things start happening all over the world. Uh, governors are shutting down churches, not allowing them to have church riots breaking out in the streets, protests, racism like we've never seen before, horrible things happening. Hurricanes. Look at how many hurricanes we've had just this year. All these natural disasters, all these crazy things. If you've been alive for any length of time, you can't deny the fact that 2020 has just been awkwardly, oddly, uniquely different. And you would agree that the, inside your heart that there's just something happening. Can we all agree there's something happening? So what we're going to do in this series is we are going to unpack what the Bible has to say about that something that's happening. We're going to show you how very clear and how very concise how powerful, how supernatural God's word is down to the detail, down to the day. In many cases, how detailed God has been at explaining to us the signs of the times. So as we talk about the end times, I'm going to give you a $5 word you can stick in your back pocket, all right? This is called eschatology. The study of the end times is actually called eschatology. So now you know. If anybody ever throws that word at you, you know what it means. Listen. The Bible is so precise, as Brad said, 27 to 30% of your Bible, if you actually still have one of these paperback Bibles, these are my favorite right here, not just your U version, but an actual Bible, 27 to 30% is on in time prophecy. Now listen to me. God did not want us to be ignorant 
about these times that we're living in. He wanted us to begin when things got crazy for us to be able to go back and say, what did God's word have to say about that? He doesn't want us to be ignorant. Look, Isaiah 46, verse 9, it says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Verse 10, I want you to underline this. Declaring the end from the beginning. So we know that there is an end time because God said it right here. It was prophesied in Isaiah. God knows the end time from the beginning. He's the one who established it all. But what is so incredible to me as we study the word of God is it says in Amos, Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, that the Lord never does anything. Say anything. You're going to have to stay with me today. He doesn't ever do anything until he reveals his plans to his servants, the prophets. What this tells me as we begin to study this out, God is not trying to trick you. He's not trying to be super mysterious. He is trying to unveil to you, unveil to us what he is going to do in the end times, how it's all going to lay out. And I get this. It's overwhelming. All right? As pastors, is it overwhelming, the study of the end times, eschatology? Yes. yes. It's, overwhelming. it's overwhelming. My mind is like right now spinning with so much information, and we're trying to decide what information do we share with you because we want you to understand this in a very clear and concise way that when you walk out of here, you could talk to your friends who don't know Jesus. Those who don't believe like you, you could walk out of here and talk to them and clearly help them to understand. Yeah. So you can pray for us today that we can deliver this in a clear way. But here's really what we're doing. We don't want you to be scared. Some people are very fearful as they start studying the end times, and it's kind of like this. I'm not doing it. I'm going to skip over to John 3.16. I'm going to go to those easy scriptures like, I can do all things through Jesus <laughs> who gives me strength. Those are in there, and they're great. But you need to understand that this is not to scare you. It's not to breed fear. The reason we're doing this series is the exact opposite. It is to bring comfort, comfort to you. It's also to inform you and to help you to understand so that you are not ignorant as the times continue to roll on. All right? Everybody say this. Be ready. Be ready. At the end of this series, at the end of the day, every single week, our intention is that you would be ready for what is to come. Be ready ready, that your house would be ready. Fathers and husbands, Amen. it's your, your responsibility would be to ready. get your house in order. Be ready. Here All we right. go. We love being your pastors. We love being your shepherds. We are about to pour it out, and we are so excited to share these things with you, to inform you, to educate you, to get you ready. Say ready. ready. To get you ready for anything that comes our way. But before we get in, we have to pray. This morning, as Misty and I, you know, every Sunday morning, we come super early. We pray over the seat that you're sitting in right now. We prayed for you already. And as we were praying this morning, the Lord gave us a very clear vision of people with yokes around their neck. And a yoke is uh, basically like with oxen that pull a, a plow. Um, they're enslaved uh, to the work that they're committed to. And I think what God's trying to tell us is that there's some of you in this sanctuary, some of you listening, watching online. You are so busy doing your own thing. You're working your own plan that you're not in a position to hear and to see what God wants you to see. Misty was praying and also and the Lord showed her scales over people's eyes. So there's people in this sanctuary, there's people watching online. The enemy wants to keep you so busy with your own thing, with your own life, that you are enslaved to your own plan to where you're not in a position to hear the message that we're about to bring you, because if you were to hear the message we're about to bring you and the messages to come over the next few weeks, it will completely change your life and it will change the lives of those that you know, those that you love. So we are praying this morning that whatever yoke might be around your neck, that you'd be set free from that, that any scales that would be over your eyes would be loosened, that you would be able to see what God is trying to show you, because this is this may be the most important messages you hear before things change and before things shift in eschatology. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask, God, through this powerful, timely series that you would remove any obstacles from our lives that would prevent us from truly understanding the plan that you have set out so long ago, thousands of years ago in your writings. We pray, God, that you would open our eyes to see what you're trying to show us, that you would unclog our ears to hear, take the yoke 
off of necks this morning and set us free to be able to uh, really receive what you have for us through this series. Help us to be ready for anything. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay, so the uh, series text that we're going to be really coming back to through the whole series is found in Matthew 24 and 44. We're going to move really fast, so just hold on. You also be ready. Say, be ready. ready. All the time. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, he will, he will come... He will come, he will come when least expected. All right, there are, I'm going to show you a timeline, and we're going to refer back to this timeline throughout, the, throughout this, this series. And so there's some things that you need to understand. There are three ages of time that you need to get. Right now, currently, we exist, we are living in what is called the church age. Some people uh, call it the age of grace, all right? This is the age in which Jesus has come, he, he died, he, he resurrected, came back to life, and so now you and I can call upon the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection to save us, to forgive us of our sins, to call upon him as Lord of our lives, and to live for him, and it is called grace. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we've earned. It's something that he freely gives us as a gift because we've called upon the power of the resurrection and his blood, which saves us. That is happening right now. But this age that we are living in, living in will soon come to an end. And then we'll begin what is called the severe age of grace or what the Bible calls the tribulation period. This is a, this is a period of seven years. Say seven years. There's a period of seven years that is about to come on the earth. This is the severe age of grace. During this time, it is possible to come to Christ. But if you choose to come to Christ at this time, the only way that you will be able to do that is by denying or rejecting the Antichrist and his power to control you through what is called the mark of the beast. And the only way to come to Jesus at that point is to be beheaded. That's found in Revelation chapter 20. Now, if you'll take note down here, rapture of the church. This is a key event that we'll be talking about in detail next week. We're going to be talking about really what the rapture of the church is and what timing we're looking at in regards to the rapture of the church according to Scripture. So according to this timeline, I, I want to give a, a disclaimer right now. There's a lot of beliefs in the church. Um, there's a lot of opinions about the interpretation of Scripture. What we're sharing with you is what is called a premillennial view, all right, or pre-tribulation view. We have studied and studied and studied and studied, and we will fight tooth and nail <laughs> to, to, uh, to teach this point that we believe in this position. However, I will tell you, there are believers that we know and love that do not believe the rapture of the church is going to take place before the tribulation. They believe that it will take place in the very middle of the severe age of grace. And there's some that believe it will happen at the very end towards the final judgment in the millennial reign of Christ. So there are different views on when the rapture of the church is going to happen. Next week, you don't want to miss because we're going to show you so many scriptures that if you take the scriptures in their context... If you were to take other scriptures talking about the coming of Christ, they contradict themselves if you look at it in any other view than the view we're talking about right now. So we believe, Misty and I, your pastors, believe that the rapture of the church is the next event on God's calendar, okay? Hands down. So during the severe age of grace, you're going to see three and a half years called the rise of the Antichrist. It's 42 months. If you have, were here for the series 42, this is part of that series. If you were not, you really need to go back and watch that whole series on 42 because it will blow your mind. Long story short, this sanctuary, we had no idea what God was doing, but he made this sanctuary 4,200 square feet, 60 by 70, to prove or to point towards what is happening in the end time harvest. You got to watch the series. It will blow your mind. All right. The second three and a half years of the great tribulation, uh, of the tribulation period is called the great tribulation. That is when all hell is truly going to break loose on the planet. You better hope that you're not here for that because if you are, it's going to be a really, really horrible place to be, horrible place to live. That's why we want you to be ready for anything and go in the rapture. Seven years. Then what will happen is the second coming of Christ. This is another return of Christ. Don't get confused when you're reading scripture. Sometimes you might be reading a scripture that has to do with this, his return when he comes back again, but he's going to come riding a white horse 
called faithful and true, and he's going to have a sword in his hand. He's going to be ready to kick butt and take names. That's not what Jesus is about to do in the rapture of the church. I'm going to explain what the rapture is going to look like here in just a moment. Moment. When Jesus comes back the second time, then he will establish the millennial reign of Christ, which is a thousand years where believers will reside and basically rule and reign the earth with Christ from Jerusalem, from Israel. All right, then we see the final judgment. Now, this final judgment is when God sits on his throne. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into eternity with me. That's when your salvation is sealed. It's done. Nothing can change it. It's also when, for those of you who chose not to know him as shepherd and Lord of your life, that is when your fate is final. It's when he says, depart from me, you doer of iniquity. I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. He doesn't say I never had religion with you. He says, I never had a relationship with you. And then we enter into the third age, which is called the eternal age. That is when God brings heaven down to earth, establishes what he tried to establish in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, and there is a perfected heaven on earth, and that will last forever. I'm out of breath. Okay. Woo! Take Woo. a breath. It's still you. Still me. <laughs> Three ages, age of grace. Uh, gave the disclaimer. Okay, so let's explain the rapture just for a second. Okay, First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Hey, uh, let me tell you something else before I'll give you a breath. When we go to conferences and people sandblast us with information, here's a really quick tip. Take a picture of the screen with that slide, okay? So then when you're taking notes and you go back and you study hey. it because you're going to want to, you can have that screen, you can have that slide to look at because that timeline is really, really important. And I know that we're going fast, and it's because we don't want this series we need to, to go last faster. forever, okay? And those three ages that Brad explained – those will be the parts of this series. So today we're in part one. We're talking about the signs of the times. Next week in part two will be the rapture. We'll be giving you all the details of when we believe the rapture according to the word of God is going to happen. Part three will be the tribulation. And I'll just tell you right now, I truly believe that there's a lot of butts and seats in churches this morning who will miss the rapture and who will be here for the tribulation. And if you are here for the tribulation, you better be here for part three because we're going to tell you what you need to know if you're still here. All right? I tell my kids that all the time. I'm like, you better be ready to go with us because if you're not, yeah. you do Can not. Can we pull that slide back up of the There you go. Ages. Take a picture. You don't want to be here for um. the tribulation. And then in part four, one sec, November 1st. We're going to be talking about the millennial reign, the second coming, and we are going to have a baptism on that day. Yes. So if you have not been baptized or if you give your life to Jesus during this series, and many will, we are going to have a baptism on November 1st. That is the Sunday before the election, and this church is that going to get on our knees, and we're going to stand before God for the United States of America for and God's what is will about to be to done. Come. Do you say amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to make resources, supplemental materials available on our app. On our app, yes. Throughout this series, so these graphics and these slides, we will do our best to make those available through yes. the series. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay, let's talk about the rapture just for a second. It's clearly explained in First Thessalonians four thirteen through eighteen. It says this: "But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. That's why we're doing this series concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope." For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, that's you and I, and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are dead. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. All right, that's a victory cry. That's the cry that they shout in battle. This is the cry of, of Jesus shouting that he has overcome death, hell, and the grave. Uh, then... With the voice of an archangel, an archangel always announces with a trumpet that the king has arrived. Amen. And we're going to hear a blasting of a trumpet. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. You will hear the blasting of the trumpet of the archangel. And that is the moment where within a millisecond, you're not going to have time to hear the blast and be like, oh, Jesus, make me right with you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're not going to have time to do that. This is literally, when you look at the text, it is, it is less than a second. When we hear the trumpet blast, and then here's it's a actually one million one million second of a second. Of we'll, a second. we'll teach you that next week. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. This is all going to transpire in a millisecond. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we, you and I, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up. Say caught up. 
All right, this, the, the Latin word is harpazo, the Greek word, um, I'm sorry, the Greek word is harpazo, the Latin word is rapturo, and that's where we get the word rapture. We will be snatched away, we will be seized, like somebody grabs you and just, thunk, like, you know, when you put your deposit in the bank seal and, thunk, and it's gone, that's what rapturo means, just, thunk, and you are out of here. Within a millisecond, we are going to be together with each other in the clouds, with those with the dead that is risen in Christ. First, we're going to meet up with Jesus in the clouds, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort, say comfort. Comfort one another with these words. The basis of everything that we're teaching in this series and the timing of the rapture based on that timeline comes and directs to not only being ready, but being comforted, all right? Next week and the week after, we're going to share some things with you that are going to happen during the tribulation, and there's no way possible there's anything comfortable for those who are alive in Christ that we would experience during the tribulation period. So there's, there's nothing comforting about that whatsoever. That's one reason why we believe we are not going to be here for the tribulation, because that's not comfortable, all right? It doesn't mean things aren't going to get really tough, because we've kind of had a tough year, have we not? And there's more signs and there's more things to come. There can be more tribulation that we will experience while we are here, but we believe it could be any moment, say moment. It could be any moment before Jesus returns. We hear the blasting of the trumpet, and within a millisecond, those of us who love Jesus, who know his voice as shepherd of our lives, who have not religion, not sitting in a seat, not watching online, but those who really know him and know his voice will be caught up, and we will be caught away. You know, the incredible thing about the word of God is, as I said earlier, God lays everything out through prophecy. He revealed everything to his prophets before it happened. So this morning, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 9. If you have your Bible, you're really going to want to watch this with me as I take you through this. Do not zone out. Because I want you to understand that God has a calendar. Just like you have a calendar on your phone. God has a calendar, and from the beginning of time, he literally put the dates on the calendar so he wouldn't forget a, a, a very important appointment, okay? God has a calendar. In Daniel chapter 9, God reveals to us the end time calendar. Now listen to me. What we call the read, end times. I have read the Bible all the way through from cover to cover at least 20 times, probably more, Okay. When I have read this, it is so easy to get so confused by the numbers and the multiplication that you need to do to figure it all out. Who's got time for that in your 15-minute challenge? You just skim over it, you read it, you move on. Today I'm going to break down for you Daniel chapter 9, and this is one of the most important prophecies on the end times. And I'm going to do my very best to make it it's fascinating. concise it's where fascinating. you can understand. But the question that we're really looking at today is this, are we living in the end times? Are we? I'm going to answer it for you right now. The answer is yes. Yes. Hands down. Resounding yes. yes. We are living in the end times. Believe it or not, the Bible actually tells us in Daniel chapter 9, the actual specific day that the end times began. Okay? Go with me. Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 20. Brad's literally telling me to go faster. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. I know. I'm going to do my very, very best. We might just hold you and let the next service come in, and then they can go back and catch up. No, Bring a sack kidding. lunch. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. In Daniel chapter 9, you need to understand this. The Israelite people in Daniel have been taken into captivity. We've talked about this many times. They are not in the land of Israel. They're not in Jerusalem right now. Daniel is in Persia. Why? Because they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were overtaken by the Persians. And at this time in history, in the passage I'm about to read to you, Daniel is in the Persian kingdom, okay? And the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, comes to Daniel and he basically says this, I want you to understand what is about to happen. And he gives him this vision and then he unveils exactly what the vision is means. So you need to understand this because they are in captivity. All right, I'm starting in verse 20, and it says this. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. This is Daniel talking. 
pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem. Remember, they're not there. So their hearts are broken because literally because of their disobedience and their rebellion, God had them exiled. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen earlier in a vision, came swiftly to me at the, during the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I am here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God. I want you to understand something about this right here. The reason God unveils his end times is because you are precious to him. He does not want you to be caught off guard. Every passage of scripture we're going to go through in the next few weeks, when you hear it say, he's going to come like a thief in the night, you better be ready. He is talking about unbelievers who are not ready, and that's why he will come like a thief in the night. It was unknown to them. But if you are a believer, God says, I laid it all I out. I showed you right very clearly. Here. If you will just read my word, you will understand. You will not be ignorant because you are precious to me. I am telling you ahead of time what right. is about to happen. It's like a parent telling your kid, if you disobey, you're going to get your butt beat. You know what? I already pre-warned you. God is pre-warning us ahead of time of what is to happen. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of the vision. All right, here we go. Verse 24. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for your people and your holy city. Listen, 70 sets of seven. Let's do some math. 70 times seven is 490. All right. Some of you are like, I'm not even trying. I mean, that's going too long. Add a zero. <laughs> 70 sets of seven is 490 days. All right. The end time period is 490 days. I'm sorry, day, yes, years, sorry, thank you. You can bring any correction. 700, 70 times seven is 490 years. All right, now go on with me. And it says this, this is what has to happen in those 490 years. Take a breath. To finish the rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the holy place. So the angel Gabriel is explaining to Daniel that there is going to be a period of time, okay, of 490 years that it is going to be the end times. And during those 490 years, six things have to happen. If you throw back up verse 24 for me, these six things have to take place during that time. Finish the rebellion, put an end to sin, atone for guilt, bring in everlasting righteousness, confirm the prophetic vision, and anoint the holy place. Now I want you to pick back up in verse 25. We're going to move on. Now listen and understand. This is where it can kind of get confusing. Seven sets of seven, which is what? What's seven times seven? Forty-nine. So seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven. What is 62 times seven? It's 432. Okay, those two combined will pass from the time, listen to this, the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, this is Jesus, Messiah the Prince, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses, that is a wall, despite the perilous times. So what this, I am trying. You're t oh, no. I mean, come on, like, hey, good job, honey. No, he doesn't. He means, good. like, come on, like, speed No, I mean, up, we have 10 minutes left. That's really what I meant. Listen, I, it's pointless. If I, sl if I go too fast, everybody will miss it. Okay, so listen to me. The end times began when the command or the decree would go forth to rebuild Jerusalem. The last two weeks, we talked about a guy by the name of Nehemiah. Do you remember that? All right. In the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, there is a decree that goes forth by Artaxerxes, the king. I'm going to call him King Art, all right? King Art gives the decree that Gabriel was talking about right here. It was at that moment in time that the end times began. And believe it or not, historians know what that date is. That date literally was. I'm going to turn my page because I know it by memory, but I don't want to screw it up. 
That date was March 14th, 445 B.C. That was the literal day that the end times began because he said it will start when a decree or a command is given to go rebuild Jerusalem. So it started. Now listen, then it said this. There would be 400, let's go back and do our math, okay? There would be seven sets, which is 49, and 62 sets of seven, which is 432, right? Those two combined, those two dates combined, which is 483 years from the giving of the command until what? Until the Messiah, the Prince, is on the scene, okay? So if you can see this in your head, the command by King Art is given on March 14th, 445 B.C. 483 years has to go past, and then Jesus will be on the scene, and he will be declaring himself king. Now listen to me. We're not talking about the birth of Christ, because when Jesus came, he did not declare himself king until one specific day in history. That specific day in history we call today Palm Sunday, all right? Listen to me, 483 years had to go by, and the day that Jesus himself rode into Jerusalem was actually, historians can prove this, I could take you all through it, but I don't have time, was April 6, 32 A.D. Now, if you'll throw up a slide. To the day. To the day. Listen to me. I'm going to take you really quick through this. The decree goes forth on March 14, 445 B.C. That is the first day of the end times. The triumphal entry, which is the day that Jesus literally declared himself, I am the king, was April 6, 32 A.D. Now listen to me. The prophecy was that there would be literally 483 years, which would be 173,880 days. So here's the question. Is that really the amount of days that was between the decree on March 14th, 445 B.C., and the triumphal entry. And here's how you do the math, all right? You can see that between 445 B.C. and 32 A.D., there was 173,740 days. Between March 14th and April 6th, there was 24 days. Then you have to figure in the leap years, all right? And without going into tons of history, it was 116 days. Now, that totals 173,880 days. And can I just say this, if you're a mathematician, during those days, they were following a lunar calendar, okay? The Hebrew calendar, a lunar calendar, it only had 360 days versus 365 that ours has. So to the day, there was 163,880 days. Can I just tell you, God specifically down to the day said a decree will go forth, Jesus will declare himself King of kings and Lord of lords on specific days, 483 years apart, and it happened. Can I tell you something? This is not just any book. This is not just the most read book in all of history. This is the book. It's God's breath. It's God's word literally laying out so that you and I can understand and be ready because he really is coming back. In the next six minutes. <laughs> I'm trying so hard. I'm going to give you three days of research. Hey, I cut out a big part. You did right a good there. job. I just cut all that out. You did off. really good. I'll save some of that for later. All right. Seriously, like put your bootstraps on. We're going to fly. All right. Isaiah 62, 6 through 7 says that God will not rest until he establishes Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel. Watch Israel. And what's happening in Israel, and you can see God's calendar unfolding. Just watch the news. Just read international reports and look at what's happening in Israel. There's been a fight continually for peace in the Middle East, and it's all over Jerusalem. The land belongs to God. The land belongs to God's people. Jerusalem belongs to the people of Israel. There has constantly been a fight. There will continue to be a fight all the way through the age, the tribulation and the severe age of grace. You will continue to see the fighting. But the closer you see Israel getting, the more you see people, Israelis, Jews, migrating into, into Israel 
and making their capital city Jerusalem, you will know the signs of his coming. We are getting closer and closer and closer. Can I throw in 30 seconds? Well, sure. Oh, I know, you'll let me. Why not? <laughs> I want you to understand, if you don't know anything about the Bible, that God chose a bloodline through who Jesus would come through. His name was Abraham, all right? Abraham was born, you can throw up this slide, in 1948 B.C., Abraham was born. That was the day he was born. This was going to be the father of the Jewish nation, all right? Let me blow your mind with something else. In 1948, on A.D., AD 1948, yeah. March, March 14th. Right? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm scaring myself. Yeah, March 14th. Yes, on March 14th. 1948. Yes. March 14th, 1948, Israel was declared a nation. In one day. In one day. All right? 1948, B.C., Abraham is born. Father of the Jewish 1948 nation. 1948 years after Adam, Abraham was born. Exactly. And in 1948, A.D., after Israel is declared a nation in one day. After it was Jesus is proclaimed king, 1948 years later, Israel becomes a nation. And it was prophesied that it would happen in, in a day. day. Okay. Keep your eye on Israel. In Why? 1917, what's called, you can look this up, Google it. Balfour, B-A-L-F-O-U-R, declaration happened. So long story short, Great Britain, uh, one of the guys in their cabinet, Lord Balfour, he says, hey, uh, the Israeli people, is, they have a homeland. And we are declaring, Great Britain, one of the world superpowers of the day, the king agreed, the cabinet agreed, that Israel is a possession of the Israeli people and it belongs to them. At this point, the Israelis were scattered all over the globe. They did not have a homeland. But all the prophecies point directly towards God gathering his Jews, his people, his chosen people, and gathering them to this land. When, in 1917, when Balfour made that declaration, they, Great Britain was backing the Israelis. They're saying, come from Spain, come from Russia, come from Africa, wherever you are all around the globe, start migrating into your homeland. This land belongs to you. And there was a great fuss, a big fight about it. And then what happened is in 1948, that was just years before 1948, they became a nation in one day, all right? Uh, when that happened, and then, okay, now, now, a hundred years later from 1917 in 1927, not, not, how many years is that? 2000, yeah, what year is it? What year are we living in? In 2017, President Donald Trump numbers? declared that because up till now, yes, Jerusalem has been occupied by Israel, but it's not been internationally recognized by all the other international communities that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. But President Donald Trump in 2017 declared that, that Jerusalem is the capital city of Jerusalem, and he moved the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Listen to me very carefully, those watching online and those in this house. President Donald Trump has done more for the children of Israel and God's chosen people than any president since 1948 combined. Combined. And whether you like him or not, it's just a fact. It doesn't make any difference politically where you stand. It's just the, the fact truth. Is it's just a fact. He has done more for Israel, and that fulfilled prophecy when that actually happened. Here's the prophecy. I believe that that fulfilled. Deuteronomy 28 and 13, and the Lord will make you, Israel, the head and not the tail. When they were given Jerusalem and when the international communities, reckon, especially America, one of the superpowers, recognizes Jerusalem as the capital city, that put Israel in a place of authority over all the other nations around them. We're talking about a country the size of New Jersey that all the other countries around them have been trying to wipe out for thousands of years and nobody has been able to do it because God has had his hand on them and he has preserved them and protected them. I believe in 2017 when President Trump did this, it was the fulfillment of this prophecy that says you shall become the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. And if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, be careful to observe them and these things shall come to pass. All right, very quickly, it's 1030. We're going to go over. Okay. You, you want to hear, hear what I'm about to tell you, okay? Uh, God gave us signs. The Hebrew calendar is based off of the sun, moon, and stars. It is based off of a, uh, a calendar in the sky. 
In Joel chapter 2, verse 31, the prophet Joel prophesied this. The sun in, this, in the coming of the signs of the times of Jesus' return. This is what you'll see. The sun shall be turned into darkness. How many of you guys have ever seen a solar eclipse lately? Anybody? Okay. And the moon into blood. That's a lunar eclipse. How many of you guys have seen any lunar eclipse in the last few years? Yes? Okay. Because I hadn't seen any. And all of a sudden here in uh, what, 2014 and 15, we saw four of them. When you see four lunar eclipses in a row, it's called a tetrad. Here's what's interesting, is that these lunar eclipses, these tetrads have happened on Jewish holidays, on Jewish holy feast days, on the day, just like Misty explained, there are hundreds of prophecies that have come to pass. Jesus fulfilled all, uh, uh, close to 400 prophecies just by being here on the planet and the things that he did. But check this out. You look at the Jewish calendar. You look at the sun, moon, and stars. The first tetrad, let me see if I can explain this right. Okay. In 1948, 1949, there was only, in, in the span of 500 years previous to the nation of Israel becoming a nation, 500 years, one tetrad took place. It was 1492 and 1493. Anybody want to take a shot at what happened in 1492? Say it with me. Columbus sailed the ocean blue. All right. That, those four tetrads happened during Jewish holy feasts. At the same time, why was Columbus coming to America looking for land? Well, it just so happens that the Jews, I told you Jews were scattered all over the world, right? There was tons of Jews in Spain, and they were being kicked out of Spain. So why is Columbus looking for a land? Some scholars believe that Columbus was Jewish and that he was looking for a homeland for the people of Israel. These four tetrads happened during Jewish holy feasts and happened in those two years um, during the time that the Israelites were kicked out of Spain. Then 500 years later, we see a tetrad, the four blood moons happen while Israel is being established as a government in 1949 and 1950. These are all fulfillment of prophecies. The third tetrad happens. Remember, I said one only happened in 500 years. Now they're boom, 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 coming up to next week. We're going to explain the three days, a thousand days a day, and a day's a thousand years in scripture. When you see a thousand years takes place and on the timeline, you're looking at one day to God. Okay. The next tetrad happened in 1967. Just like 20 years later, that was during the Six-Day War of Israel, where, is, where God gave Israel more than double the possession of homeland, where their borders were expanded. God gave them more of their homeland. This was another fulfillment of prophecy. The fourth tetrad happened 2014, 2015, and this is when the Temple Institute and many organizations in Israel began really ramping up their plans to start rebuilding the temple of Israel because the temple is going to be rebuilt one more time according to scripture and prophecy. And they started ramping up their efforts to rebuild the temple. Next week we're going to talk a lot about that because that's all going to take place. It, if you're a believer, you're going to be raptured out of here and you're not going to see that temple. If you do see that temple, you better hope to God that you come to Christ during that time, and then you're going to be beheaded. So I'm trying to tell you now because I want you to get it right now so you don't have to be here later because, you know what I'm saying. So here's what's crazy, all right? In over now, in order for the temple to be rebuilt, according to Scripture, Numbers 19 and 2, let me read this Scripture. This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer. Say red heifer. Without blemish, that's really important, in which there is no defect on which uh, a yoke has never come. The first red heifer in over 2,000 years was born on, Mar on August 28, 2018. The heifer exists now. It's in the possession of, it was born in Israel. They have the Temple, um, temple Institute, uh, I think. Now, don't quote me on that. Somebody has the red heifer. I don't know who has the cow, but they have it. It's alive, and it has gone through multiple, multiple examinations to make sure that it's suitable for a sacrifice, that it's without blemish, and it passes all tests on every level. It is suitable. Now the Israelites, now the Jews, now the Jews know that the temple, this is pointing. You guys have any idea on the timeline, on the calendar, how close we are? 
All the Jews know now that they have the red heifer and all these signs have come to pass that now they can rebuild the temple. Just recently, I don't, like a month ago, okay, you guys know the Dome of the Rock. You know that there is a big fight between the Arab nation and the Israelites. They both think it's theirs, okay? Just recently, for years, up till now, the Jews have not been allowed on that Temple Mount. Just a month or two ago, they gathered on the Temple Mount. They raised the Israeli flag, and they began worshiping and praying prayers for the people of Israel there at the Dome of the Rock. This is huge because that's the Temple Mount. That's the location. The plans are already drawn out. When Misty and I were in Israel in 2011, we saw, we stood next to elements that will be in the temple. They were on display in the city streets of Jerusalem. The elements are ready. The red heifer is alive. Ev the plans are drawn. The institute exists. The, everything is in line for the temple to be rebuilt. There's just a few things that need to happen. We need to get raptured out of here. We've got to go. A few more things real quick. Pestilence, Luke 21, 11, And there will be great earthquakes in various places. This is how you know Jesus is about to come. Famines and pestilences. These are all plural words. Uh, COVID-19, when it was released, was released as a pestilence. The, 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 the definition of a pestilence is uh, um, an epidemic that is infectant and devastating. We are dealing with a pestilence, but it's plural, so that means that there's more to come. I don't know when, I don't know how, I don't know what it's going to look like, but there are more pestilences to come according to Scripture. That could be after we're gone, I don't know. There's going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes in various places. I'm trying to be selective here. Okay, Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Uh, Daniel's told by the angel, shut the book. There's so much stuff, it's going to blow your mind. Seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. This is how you will know that Jesus is about to come, because um, a lot of different ways to look at it, but basically you're going to see travel and technology side by side are going to just skyrocket, like it's going to be multiplied. It's, it's going to just shoot through the roof. The, the knowledge that humanity has and the technology that we have is going to be magnified over and over and over. Okay, so let's look at this. At 1900, okay, at the year 1900, it was said that every 100 years, our knowledge as humanity doubled. Follow me. Every, every 100 years, our knowledge as humanity doubled. By the 1940s, knowledge doubled every 25 years. In 2013, IBM predicted that by the year 2020, that knowledge would double every 12, no, earlier than 2020, that knowledge would begin to double every 12 months, and by the year 2020, that's now, that knowledge would begin to double every 12 hours. I want you to think about your iPhone, which has more computer capabilities than the rocket where we sent men to the moon, and it's in your pocket. Now they have the iWatch. You think about everything that they can manage and, and detect you, to your, your heart rate, everything right there on your wrist. The technology is just out of this world that we have just at our fingertips. So what you need to look at, as you see the coming and the signs of Christ, is knowledge increasing. And the more knowledge increases, the more humanity pushes God out of the way, and the things that are immoral and godless become made normal. There's a prophecy that says homosexuality will become normal in the eyes of men, and that's how you will know the coming of the times of Christ. I'm not bashing on homosexuality. I'm, I, have, I have family members, I have loved ones that are gay, and I love them with all my heart. But I'm telling you right now that it displeases God. It's an abomination to him. And, and he says that when this time comes, when homosexuality is considered normal and people get mad when you talk about it, that's when I'm going to come. And I believe we're here. Instant global information. This is another thing you need to look at. Revelation 11, 4 through 19 says that there's going to be two witnesses in the street. The, we're going to talk about these guys. They were raptured out of here. They're going to come back. They're still alive today, but they're in heaven. God's going to bring them back. And then they're going to be killed by the Antichrist in the streets. And in that scripture in Revelation, it says the whole world will watch for three and a half days their dead bodies. They will watch. How is the whole world going to watch something that happens in Israel? You can watch it on your iPhone right now if it happens. It could be on YouTube. It could be on any, any streaming you know, device. You can watch it. The technology is already here. Instant global information. Global financial control. Revelations 13, 11 through 18 talks about a cashless society. When the Antichrist rules, 
he is going to establish a socialistic one world government. He will bring the entire world together through a moneyless society, a digidollar society. How quick do you think we could go to a moneyless society if we needed to? Right now, we could do it in a flash. We could go to a moneyless digidollar society right now. This is going to be done through a microchip. Man, I don't have time to do all this. It's 1041. The microchip has existed. 1960s, in the 1960s, the barcode, the barcode was created. In that barcode, two skinny lines, beginning, middle, and end, established the mark of the beast, 666. It's in every barcode. It's in every serial number. And it's been in microchips since the 1970s. And, and microchips have been implanted in humans for years. It's already happening. Uh, just a few years ago, over 4,000, I think, Swedens uh, actually had the chip uh, implanted in their wrist. They, they used it to containing medical information, um, their banking information, to unlocking their front door. It's, it's already all over the globe, humans that have this microchip in them. You guys ever heard of a national coin shortage? Okay. So this is the, um, this is the dress rehearsal. The more you see a coin shortage, the more you're seeing God setting the scene for this transition from the church age or, or the age of grace to the rapture to the tribulation period. There's going to have to be no money in order for the Antichrist to, as a one-world government, as a socialistic government, to bring the whole world together under his rule and under his control. He's going to have to create an international money system that has no exchange rates or anything like that. It's just everybody's going to be using the same money across the globe. He's going to bring the world together, and he's going to be the hero. I'm just telling you right now, if you're here, in your eyes, he's going to seem like the savior of the world. He is going to have all the answers. He's going to pull the world together after mass chaos because the world is going to fall apart when all the Christians are out of here. It's going to absolutely fall apart. He's going to bring it back together, if you will. So look for, as, as the more you see a national coin shortage, the no, you know you're getting closer to a moneyless society. Um, you look at the... You look at the, uh, the, 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 um, the technology behind this chip, and it's already there. There's a lot of companies that are requiring that their employees, instead of having a badge, they're requiring that they have this chip put in their wrist, and it's even being put in people's foreheads, which is prophesied in Scripture very specifically in Revelation. And so the chip is already here. The technology is already here. Another thing you want to keep an eye on is human engineering. In 2015, at the Exponential Finance Conference, Ray Kurzweil, who is the lead engineer at Google, I believe, said by the year 2030, humans will be hybrids. Okay, here's what that means. It means that our brains, that, that our, our thinking will both be biological and non-biological. It means that they will be able to take our DNA strands and attach them to tiny nanobots, and that our thoughts will be connected to the cloud. The technology is already here through 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 genetic testing, it's already here. But by 2030, he believes it'll be perfected. He also predicted the self-driving cars, which are already here, okay? So our DNA strands will be connected to these nanobots where you will literally be, hopefully not you, but people that are here will be able to think a thought and upload their thoughts to the cloud and also download thoughts from the cloud into your mind. So they are going to augment and make better, the Antichrist is going to make better the human race. We're talking about Hitler all over again, but he's going to make Hitler look like the best babysitter you ever had watch your kids. Like the Antichrist is going to be so, so incredibly horrible. But you're going to see these things take place where, the, where humans will be, listen to this, it's going to blow your mind. How many of you guys ever seen the movie Captain America? Yeah? Good movie. Okay. Pastor Brad Did you ever think, I think Captain I'm America. Captain America, but Misty reminds me I'm not. So you think, wow, that's pretty cool, but it's just a movie. No, it's happening right now. There's an arms race between America and Russia and China. This is fact, okay? Chuck Hagel, the former defense secretary, quoted, you can, he was quoted saying that there's an arms race between America and China and Russia right now in, uh, in gene, I think it's, they call it gene type testing, through, through, through genetics testing that they are augmenting human strength and mental capacity. So they are making the super soldier. Literally, the technology right now, they are trying to perfect the technology of creating a super soldier. They're trying to make their soldiers smarter, stronger, faster, and more capable of doing war on a level like we've never seen before. I'm done. Wow. Blows your mind. Hey, you can research all this. It's not just, these aren't just like right. 
you know, crazy websites. It's it's a fact. It's, it's happening. It's a lot of information. It's a lot to take in. But can I boil it down to one thing? You need to be ready. We stand here as your pastors. We follow theologians who have studied their whole life on end time prophecy. And I'll tell you what almost every theologian believes, and that is there is not one prophecy that still needs to be fulfilled before the rapture happens, which tells me it could be any moment. Fathers, you're the head of your home. It's your responsibility to be pouring the word of God into your wife and into your children. Every age that is under the sound of my voice, we will each one stand before God. And God will either look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, you served me well. Or he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And the word knew is literally the same word that is, that is used when a couple gets married and they consummate the marriage. It is a, I knew you. I knew you intimately. I had a relationship with you. Not a, I went to church, check my check-in roll. I was there all the time. None of that will matter. In the millisecond when the rapture happens and we're gone. Will you bow your heads with me this morning?